Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, I don't know how many are tuned in here yet this morning, uh, but it's uh, welcome to the quarantine devotionals this morning. Um, it's uh, it's Wednesday, April the 14th, 2020. And I hope that that uh, if you're tuning in this morning, that you're already having a good morning and that you're doing well. It's a uh, and it's a beautiful day wherever it is that you are. Most of you, of course, are not too far from me here in the uh, the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. And boy, I'll tell you, this time of year is just a beautiful time of year. Uh, today, it's uh, it's going to be a high of uh, oh gosh, I'm in trouble now. Uh, well, in Celsius, it's supposed to be a high of, of 15 degrees, which is beautiful. I think that's. Uh, um, uh, 59 degrees, 59 degrees Fahrenheit if you're American. So good morning uh, from the to the McIntyres. Good morning, Barb Hyman. Nice to see you. And of course, as others tune in as well, we'll uh, we'll get a chance to say hi. But yeah, hope that you guys are doing well this morning and uh, um, and, and that you have a great day planned ahead. Um, it is going to be a beautiful day, so time to get maybe doing some spring cleaning and working on that yard a bit. I know that yesterday I had to go out late uh, and uh, uh, put down some of the lawn fertilizer just to keep the lawn looking the way it's supposed to be and uh, put a little bit of water down. But yeah, it's supposed to be a great day and a beautiful week. Um, I don't know what else you have planned today, but what better way to start out the day than, uh, than with our quarantine devotionals by getting our Bibles open. And even on those days that we don't have these devotionals, you know what, this is the way we should always uh, start our day. And if we don't start our day in God's Word, then we should at least open it up at some point. I always like to start it or end it, um, or maybe both, uh, with the reading of God's Word. When you start it, it kind of sets the tone for the day. When you, uh, If you do your devotions at night, it, it's a good thing to go to sleep on and put your head on the pillow about. But either way... Here we are, and let's get into God's Word. Before we do that, let's open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you this morning for the uh, the beautiful day that you've given to us, uh, at least here on the on the uh, the Olympic Peninsula. And if people are tuning in from elsewhere, whether it's rain or shine, Lord, it's all a gift from you. Uh, we know that uh, that nothing grows without your rain. Um, and we know that those sunny days are a blessing from you as well. So help us just each time that we look at the sun or the rain or whatever it might be today, that you would uh, you would make a thankful heart in us, Lord. Thankful for another day. Thankful for your grace if we know Jesus Christ. And if we're listening this morning and Jesus isn't our Savior, I want to pray that there'd be a realization of your goodness and uh, and that whoever's listening might, might think about... Uh, 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 accepting your offer of salvation and coming to know you as their Savior. Lord, as we open up your word this morning, we want to pray that uh, you would give us soft hearts um, and you would plant your word deep within our hearts. Let it grow, Lord, so that uh, your glory might be seen in our lives, your grace and your mercy and your love and your kindness and uh, and your truth might be seen in our lives. Um, so yeah, help us this morning as we look at this parable of the Good Samaritan, Lord, and let it examine us and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So people are kind of rolling in here this morning, and uh, that's good. So uh, the Lozano's, good to see you, Lozano's. Uh, uh, it'll be good to to see everybody back at church here uh, as things begin to open up. Well, speaking of opening up, let's open up our Bible. So let's open them up to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 this morning. And this morning, like I said, we're going to be looking at the parable of the Great Samaritan. And that's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And as you're opening there, um, oh, hi, Sherry. I didn't say hi to you this morning. I see you're on as well. And Sandy. Um, as you're going there, <clears throat> a book recommendation. Now, this is kind of an obscure book that I came across, but boy, I'm sure I'm enjoying it. I, I partway through it right now. Um, it was brought to my attention by a friend of mine who's a professor at uh, Southern Seminary. Um, it's a great deal on Amazon. And this is a book called, uh, in fact, let me put the link up there where you can order it already. Um, 
so like I said, kind of an odd book uh, in that it doesn't sound all that interesting. It's a book called Friends of Calvin. And yes, I know I really pigeonhole myself when I recommend a book like this. Uh, obviously, this guy is a Calvinist. Yes, well, it's true. But regardless of whether we can agree with on that or not, uh, or even if you agree with Calvinism, this is just still a great book. There's no denying that Calvin was a, uh, was a man of God. and um, But there's very little written on him throughout history. Uh, he was he really kind of kept to himself and when he was buried he even insisted that there be no funeral headstone for him because he didn't want any attention for himself he wanted all glory to go to God so we don't know a lot about this this guy who affected so much uh, change for Christianity and really if it wasn't for the his influence our churches wouldn't be what they are today um, but there is stuff written on those that he hung around with, his friends. And oftentimes, if you want to know something about who a person is, you look at their choice of friends. And so this is a really interesting little book. The chapters are very short. They're only about three pages each or sometimes five pages. But it's just a collection of writings on the friends of, of Calvin, uh, some of his letters to them, uh, some of the ways that they talked and helped each other. And boy, I'll tell you, you get not only an idea of who these people were, but you get an idea of the sense, what I'm finding, a, a, the sense of what true Christian friendship is, the way they sacrificed themselves for each other, the way that they spoke truth to each other. And man, boy, I tell you, it really just makes me examine what kind of a Christian friend am I to people? Because these, there, there's so many examples of, of, of what true Christian friendship is about. Uh, in this book, and it's just a beautiful picture of um, uh, of, uh, of just some amazing friendships in Christianity that really sets an example for me, and I think for you too. And along the way, you can learn about uh, um, uh, other than Luther, probably the greatest reformer, and definitely uh, the greatest biblical commentator who ever lived. So uh, the good here's here's the extra good news is that this book right now, it's only about $6 on Amazon. It's one of the cheapest books I've ever come across. Uh, so I put the link up there. Uh, it costs you almost nothing. And, you know, it's almost like a bathroom reader because you can just read these quick little chapters uh, so quickly. Um, anyway, I highly recommend this book. I didn't know what to expect, but I am really, really enjoying it. Friends of Calvin. Uh, um, uh, put out by Erdman's Publishers. Check it out. It might be something you're interested in. Okay, let's open up to, well, we're already open there, hopefully. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And I'm going to read it here. Luke 10, 25 to 37. It says, Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He asked him, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, go and do the same. <laughs> well, 
This is one of the most famous parables in the entire Bible, one of the most well-known stories. In fact, it's so well-known that we have not fairly recently made laws in certain states uh, based on uh, this parable, laws that we call the Good Samaritan laws. <laughs> if you're a, a Seinfeld fan, this was what got the, uh, uh, all those Seinfeld friends in trouble at the end of the series because they weren't Good Samaritans. But this is a very, very well-known parable, and there's reason for it. It's because it really shows us how, as Christians, we ought to be. It's been made a law because it really is ideally how all people should be to one another. But I guess the question comes up is, can we mandate people being like this to others? Can we mandate people having a heart that really has compassion and love for one another by laws? Well, of course, the answer to that question is no. You cannot uh, mandate by law people having a, the kind of heart that that uh, that this man is supposed to have, and that this man, that Jesus is telling this man he should have. And I think the point for us this morning in this text is: listen, you know, you can look like you follow God. You may know all the right answers. You may know all the right things, and do uh, technically the right things, but still not have a heart that follows God. And so, if you're a Christian listening this morning. I think the point is this, listen, don't just look like a Christian, be a Christian. Don't just look like you're a Christian, actually do what Jesus wants you to do. Because we can look like a Christian and still not really be following Jesus. And so that's kind of the first thing that I noticed in this text this morning and that impacts me is that, listen, Noel, you can look like a Christian, but technically, but still not really be following Jesus with your heart. And I think that as Christians, and the longer that we're Christians, we can do this and fall into this kind of error, looking like a Christian and really not be following Jesus. So here's a man who it tells us in verse 25, he's an expert in the law. This was a guy who knew his Bible really, really well, probably <clears throat> knew it, to quote it at least, a lot better than you and I can. Uh, Jesus asks him, it says that he's a teacher of the law. So he wasn't just a, a guy who knew his Bible well. He was uh, basically, he was a seminary professor, or a very esteemed, what we would call pastor maybe of the day. And, uh, and he asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And so Jesus asks him what's written in the law, and he does know his Bible. He quotes Leviticus 19.19 19 and Deuteronomy chapter chapter 6, verse 5, right from memory, probably better than most people could do. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which is the right answer. I mean, that sounds like the right answer. The problem was, is that a guy like this, and oftentimes Christians like you and me, uh, can be experts, become experts at doing uh, technically what the Bible says, but without, uh, without really... Um, having to sacrifice anything in our lives. And this was one of the things that Jesus really nailed the Pharisees and the teachers of, of, of the Bible on at that point, was that, you know, they were technically, and they had developed a whole system for technically doing what God wanted them to do, but um, in, in a way that they weren't violating God's laws, but it still worked out as kind of best for them. It didn't cost them anything. And, um, and it still kind of worked in their, in their favor. And so what was happening was these were guys who looked like they were following God, but they weren't really following God with their hearts at all. And I think that needs to be asked of us as Christians. Are we people who follow the Bible technically and, and we do the right kind of things, but still we really kind of work things out to be what's best for us? You see, it's possible for us as Christians to know our Bibles well, to do all of the right things, to go to church on Sunday, to go to prayer meeting, to know how to speak Christianese and, and, and do all these things, and, uh, and, and to even to be considered as people who, who are impeccable in our faith by many people. But we can do all of that without really following God's word with our heart. You know, Christians, and the longer that we're Christians, the better we get at doing this. Um, so that uh, I put a post up on our on their church Facebook page here not too long ago saying something like, 
You know, the church has law has been a cruise ship, but it needs to become a warship. We can become comfortable in our church, but are we really having a heart that follows Jesus? <clears throat> a couple of examples, um, I guess, uh, uh, just off the top of my head, here's one. So it could be any kind of thing, but but let me give this example. So younger Christians, uh, a lot of Christians from my generation and down, um, are are are, uh, are well aware of the fact that um, when it comes to drinking alcohol, does the Bible prohibit it for Christians? Well, of course, if we read our Bibles, we know that the Bible doesn't prohibit. Uh, drinking alcohol for Christians, at least in moderation, not to the point of drunkenness, but as younger Christians um, who maybe know their Bibles, what the Bible says a little bit better on this, this is something that I think a lot of young Christians have flouted uh, to those who may have sensitivities about drinking. Uh, and and this is something that, uh, that we shouldn't be doing. Um, uh, so that, uh, yeah, I can drink alcohol. Who can tell me I can't? The Bible doesn't say I can't do it. But listen, we have brothers and sisters who may be sensitive to that. And do we really love them with our heart? You know, even Paul himself says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23. And so we need to ask, is this, yes, things may be permissible, but are we really having a heart of love for our neighbor? To bring it up to speed, here's another one. In this day of COVID, okay, uh, opinions on wearing masks are all over the place. Uh, some people are very, very nervous about catching COVID. We have people in our church who are very, very concerned about that. And then you have other people who, who you yeah, have some people who think it's all a scam. And I, I, I think that's kind of silly. But, uh, but you have other people like me. I, I'm not too worried about catching COVID. First off, I don't think I probably will. But even if I do, I'm not worried about it because the recovery rates are so high. Um, but uh, even if that's the case, should we be wearing a mask around those who have sensitivities? Or we, should we just be, be uh, concerned about our own rights and the government imposing that on us? Well, you know what? There are little old ladies or, or or some others in church who are very, very nervous about it. And so to say, I don't have to wear a mask, is that really having a Christian heart towards somebody who may actually be nervous about it? I've had this conversation in our church. Uh, oh, yeah, the church has no right to tell me to wear a mask. Well, whether or not that's true is one thing. But a whole other thing is you have people who will not come to church because they're nervous about catching COVID and you're saying that you don't have to wear a mask, how, what kind of a heart is that toward people who are nervous about it or sensitive about it? Listen, we need to have the heart of a Christian toward people because we can be doing uh, maybe what the Bible says is technically right and still not having the heart of a Christian. Look at Paul and Timothy in Acts chapter 16. Paul was going out to minister the gospel to Jews, and he had Timothy along with him. Timothy was a Gentile, someone who didn't need to be circumcised. And the Bible says that Timothy didn't need to be circumcised. But what did Paul and Timothy do to be sensitive and to be loving neighbors to those they were trying to minister to and get along with? Well, he, he goes and he has Timothy circumcised. Now, that's no small operation for a man, a grown man. But they do it because of love for the neighbor. Did they need to do it? Absolutely not. In fact, Paul argues elsewhere that it doesn't need to be done, but so that they can have the heart of a Christian to those uh, around them, they go and do this. You know, we can fall into the trap of not having this kind of heart. We can tout our Christian rights, even according to scripture, and not be a good witness, not be a loving neighbor. In fact, I know some Christians who who, uh, and you know what, I've done this too. So I, I, trust me, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody, but sometimes uh, I, I, who've been rebuked about this and say, well, I'm still technically doing what the Bible says is right. And I see them taking communion when they've wronged half a dozen other people. And I'm amazed sometimes at how, uh, at how we can feel justified in taking communion when we've wronged and not been good neighbors to people. Like I say, I've done this in my life too. I think we probably all have if you've been Christians for any length of time. But guys, we need to really have the heart of a Christian because we can look like a Christian, follow everything perfectly, still not be following Jesus. We need to truly love God above all, not ourselves. 
Let, love God above all. Love our neighbor above ourselves. All of our neighbors above ourselves. And that is what it means to follow Jesus. So that's one thing. And you know, another thing that I think we can pick up from this text is that we can look like a Christian and, uh, and not really love our neighbor. So we kind of touched on this already, but let's, uh, let's go right into the parable itself that Jesus gives here. Now, it's interesting. Once this poor Jewish guy who's traveling along this road gets beaten up, who comes along and sees him? Well, the first two people who come along and see him are people who would be considered the closest to God. We have a priest. I mean, who gets closer to God than a priest in, in, in the Old Testament, right? I mean, they're it. And then we have a Levite. Again, somebody who might not be as close to God as a priest, but who is devoted to God all through Leviticus and Deuteronomy. It's the Levites who are devoted to God. They're set apart as special to God. And then the third guy who comes along is this Samaritan. Now, why has Jesus put the Samaritan in here? This is a major contrast between these this priest and Levite and the Samaritan. Because a Samaritan to this teacher of the law would be someone who's despicable, who's disgusting, who certainly doesn't do what the Old Testament says. I mean, they don't even come to the right temple to worship God. And so this would have stirred up animosity the moment that he heard the name Samaritan uh, in this parable. But Jesus, uh, this is exactly why Jesus chooses to use a Samaritan. Because even though it stirs up, here's somebody who wasn't technically following the Bible perfectly, he was the one who had the heart of God. He was the one who really loved his neighbor more than himself. And so we see this, uh, uh, it reveals the hypocrisy in this man's heart. We see it in the book of Jonah as well. We just finished Jonah uh, with, the, with the devotionals uh, with, with the kids. And, um, and, you know, Jonah was the same way. Uh, here was God wanting to save these people who weren't Jewish, who didn't follow God's law at all. And Jonah said, you know, basically, let them go to hell. Uh, they, they should go to hell. And there was a revealing of who really loves, uh, loves his neighbor. Well, Jonah didn't, right? And that's because they were outside of the Jewish comfort zone. They were outside of the camp. And that's something that we need to be careful of as Christians as well. We need to make sure that our love for loving of our neighbor doesn't, is, that's not just something that's confined to our little comfort zone, our little camp. Do those outside of our camp reveal something in our heart? So I want to give this little heart test. Let's think about this. <clears throat> when I say these names or these people, what, what, what heart feeling do you have? Joe Biden, Camilla Harris, uh, Charles Manson, liberals, if you're in Ontario listening right now, Justin Trudeau, okay? What, is, what, what do those names stir up in your heart? This is a heart test that I think we need to think about. Many, for many of us, these things stir up negative emotions. They stir up negative feelings toward us. In fact, they even stir up uh, feelings of treachery and things like that. You know, if that's what these names and these positions stir up in us, these are the exact same emotions that this teacher of the law would have felt when he heard that name, Samaritan. One of the things that we need to be careful of as Christians is that we don't demonize the lost. We need to not demonize the lost. Um, because oftentimes that's what we do. And I think that it's something that is really happening amongst, amongst Christians right now. We are demonizing the lost. We are demonizing those that we disagree with <laughs> when we don't understand that these are the blind. Do we disagree with them? We disagree with them vehemently. I, <laughs> we may, but we can't demonize the lost. We can differ with them. We can even be vocal about differing with them. We can get involved in the political process of differing with them. And I think that's a, that's a Christian's responsibility to do that. But at the end of the day, we must love them. We have to love the lost, no matter how much we may differ with them in opinion, and especially not demonize them. 
we do this in our comfortable little Christian camp. And we talk and we complain and we demonize the, uh, those who are lost and, and don't have God's direction amongst ourselves. And it reveals in us that we don't have that much of a love for our neighbor at all. Listen, differ with them perhaps and take your stand as a Christian, but love your neighbor. Because I think that sometimes if we were the ones who came across this man lying on the road, maybe it's uh, uh, somebody that we differ with politically or who we argue against or who we feel is persecuting us as a political leader or, or a uh, co-worker or something like that, would we stop and help them out? Boy, from some of the Christian talk and from some of the posts that I see on Facebook, insulting and uh, 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 insensitive posts that really show no love for people, sometimes I wonder, and I have to check my own heart for this as well, we can look like a Christian at church. We can look like a Christian to all of our Christian friends and really not love our neighbors at all. So let's be careful there. Now, the parable doesn't end there. In fact, this, this pericope doesn't end uh, just with this parable. It ends on a hopeful note. And that is that, you know what? We can look like a Christian and really be a true Christian. Look at verse 37b. <clears throat> After Jesus says, uh, who is it he, in verse 36? Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And look at verse 37. The man says, the one who showed mercy to him. And then at the end of it, Jesus told him, go and do the same. This is a hopeful note because we see here that even though the man, we know that he's wrong in his heart. This is why Jesus gave him the parable. It says in in verse uh, uh, verse 20, or where is it? Verse, uh, verse 29, that the man wanted to justify his behavior and his heart attitude. At the end, it's possible that the man had a heart change. Jesus says, go and do the same. You see, the man, he sees the point. Verse 37 is in there. The man didn't just walk away and throw up his arms and say, ah, forget this. I'm not doing that. He admits the answer is right. The man sees the point, and Jesus gives this man another opportunity. You know what? God does the same with us. You and I, we mess up as Christians, and we have hard attitudes that aren't right. We don't always give God the glory first. We don't always love our neighbor as we should. But you know what? There's another opportunity, and this teacher of the law has another opportunity. And if he does, so do you and I. You see, God sees us with love. When I read this, when Jesus says, go and do the same, I think he saw that man with love. And he gives him another opportunity. And God sees us with love. He gives us another opportunity as well. You know, we need to see others. The lesson for this man was that you need to see others the way God sees them and love them. We need to do that too. We need to see others the way God sees them. And we need to have compassion. We need to see others the way that God saw us before we were Christians and have compassion. We need to be thankful also for God's correction because God does correct us with texts like this. And we need to rethink about whether or not we're living simply uh, to not get in trouble by God. And so we're technically living by, the, by his rules in the Bible or whether we're living out of a love for God and a love for his glory and a love for those he created. We need to think about that. And then we need to take another shot as Christians at loving those that we differ with, loving those that we may not see eye to eye with, loving those who, who may seem despicable to us. You know, let's take another shot at that because Jesus is telling us here, listen, he, give, he gives this man another shot and he's giving you and I another shot. Don't just look like a Christian in church, at prayer meeting, don't just look like a Christian to yourself. Really be a Christian. Be what Jesus was to you and me. Somebody who, 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 who is in glory. I mean, the ultimate comfort zone. But he went outside and he lowered himself to relate, even be killed by those who are despicable, you and I, and see them come to Jesus. Guys, let's be careful not to just look like Christians. Let's really be Christians from the heart.
And that's what Jesus tells us this morning. Well, I hope that that's been a blessing to you. I know that it's uh, it, it was a blessing to me as I look through this. Makes me think about my own heart toward loving my neighbor, really bringing, bringing God glory. And uh, let's walk away and chew on that this morning. Well, before we close off in prayer, uh, just a couple of reminders. I want to remind you of prayer meeting tonight at 7 o'clock p.m. I'll send out the uh, the email for those of San Juan Baptist Church, and I'll be posting it on Facebook. If you're not from our church, that's fine. You can still join us. Um, uh, what else? Friday afternoon, we have the uh, Take It to the Streets Road Sign Ministry. Uh, just a very simple ministry. It's pretty painless, standing by the street and holding a sign about Jesus to the uh, thousands of cars that pass by on a Friday afternoon. So that takes place at the corner of Mill Road and Highway 20, just outside of Port Townsend at 4 o'clock. It's between 4 and 5.30. If you can't stay for the whole thing, that's fine. If you don't have a sign, that's fine. I spent like uh, a number of hours last week just doing up a whole bunch of signs. So I have one for you, uh, but you can come out there. Um, I want to promote something as well at Quilcene Bible Church. Uh, starting on May the 1st, I believe, they're having a uh, kind of a course on how to interpret your Bible. And I want to endorse this. Uh, Greg Grismer, he's the pastor at Quilcene Bible Church. He's a good, good man, a good, solid pastor. He knows his Bible well, and uh, and uh, he can help you to, to understand that a little better. So uh, so take advantage of that. Give the church a call, and he'll tell you, tell you all about that. Um, other than that, I uh, listen guys if you're able to I want to encourage you again to get out to church things are starting to open up a bit more and uh, and just go be with God's people if you haven't been for a while um, uh, and uh, and take in the word it's always good to be at church uh, Hebrews 10 25 tells us don't be in the habit of not going to church uh, if you if you're able to so those are all the things. If you have something or your church is doing something, post it on here so that the rest of us know and maybe can benefit from that. And uh, yeah, we can be a blessing to one another. Well, let's close out our morning in prayer. Lord God, we want to thank you for what your word has to say to us again this morning. We thank you uh, that you keep us in check because it is often the case that we can become very comfortable in the church. and We can become really good at at dotting our I's and crossing our T's when it comes to our Christianity so that uh, we find ourselves justified in the behaviors and attitudes that we feel. But we don't want to be like this teacher of the law, how he justified himself. We want to be people who really love you, love our neighbors as ourselves, Lord. Um, this is the only way that we're going to reach the lost. doing it and if we're truly christians and truly christ followers then we'll do what you did and we will lay ourselves low so that others can uh, know your grace know your love know your morning bless each one that may be listening in posterity And we just ask that uh, your name be glorified. In God bless. Have a good day. And maybe we'll see you at one of these things. Maybe we'll just see you back here next Wednesday morning. Whatever the case, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. God bless.